Good afternoon. Let's do some business. We are doing it live right here, weekday afternoons at 4 o'clock. We get right down to business here, a news-driven hour after Ben Shapiro and just before the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang at 5, Motec on Money, live on the air right here, 790 KBC, streaming live online worldwide at kbc.com, and your on-demand Motec on Money podcast, kbc.com, Apple, iTunes, all your favorite podcast platforms. Today, coming to you live from day two of the Milken Institute 2024 Global Conference in Beverly Hills, which itself has pumped up the economy in a big way, attracting about 4,000 movers and shakers from around the world here, including 1,000 prominent speakers. We'll get the highlights of what's happening here from economist Kevin Cloudon, executive director of the Milken Institute, finance, AI, artificial intelligence, and how it affects businesses, jobs, education, and all of society. Big topic of conversation here. I'll talk about that later this hour with one of the keynote speakers at this conference, Greg Emerson, global head of tech capital for the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, who's in town from Silicon Valley. Stocks finishing mostly higher today with the Dow posting its fifth straight day of gains. The S&P 500 saw its largest four-day advance since November. The Dow coming in for a closing gain of 32 points. The S&P 500 seven, but the Nasdaq pulled back 17 points. Treasury yields eased uh, this afternoon on uh, news that uh, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari said he could not rule out the chance that the next move from the Fed will be a rate hike. The yield in the 10-year note actually pulled back to 4.46%. Neil Kashkari, a former Republican candidate for governor here in California, making that news while speaking here at the Global Conference in Beverly Hills. Earnings parade continues with quarterly earnings from Disney, setting that media conglomerate stock down 9.5%, also weighing on the broader market. Oil hot ring just below $80 a barrel now as we watch the latest headlines in the Middle East. The U.S. says negotiations on a Gaza ceasefire should be able to close the gaps between Israel and Hamas, while Israeli forces seize the main border crossing in Rafah. Cash has been outperforming much of the bond market, by the way, this year, giving the so-called T-bill and chill community cause for celebration. As MarketWatch notes, the major driver of cash's outperformance over bonds has been the Fed's delayed pivot to rate cuts this year, as aspects of inflation have proven harder to tame than expected, as you've been hearing right here. And joining us live now on Your Money, the Markets, and the Economy and the Whole Works, Money Manager Ken Winans, President of Winans Investments, author of Investment Atlas 1 and 2, market historian, also Forbes magazine contributor. Ken Winans, welcome to Beverly Hills. Great to have you with us here this afternoon. Well, thank you, Frank. And as you know, I am now a uh, official Nevada resident, so you're not too far down the freeway, but it's nice to at least be able to talk a little closer than from Northern California. Fantastic. Well, great to have you with us uh, on the air live here, uh, Ken Winans. And give us your impressions here of what's happening, news uh, being made here with uh, Neil Kashkari saying the Fed cannot rule out a, a rate hike. Uh, give us your reaction to that. Frank, you know, it, and I've been very consistent on this, you know, since the you and I were very early to spot inflation back during the COVID pandemic. And I remember even back then I said that, look, history supports the view that inflation cycles run six to eight years. And I know that at the time the Fed was saying that inflation was transitory and it would magically disappear very quickly. It clearly didn't. They were late coming to the party to battle it. With all that said, we're now looking that I'm, pro unfortunately, that I'm probably going to be right, that inflation is like rust on metal. You can scrub it, put goop on it to try to get rid of it, but it's very, very hard to get out of an economic system. And just to give you a case in point of why what uh, Mr. Kashkari was saying, I'm looking at the earnings reports coming out today, and I was really surprised to see that the groups that were moving were the groups that were able to pass on cost increases to their end consumers. I'm looking at consumer staples. I, I'm, in fact, I'm really surprised to see that a lot of the alcohol companies, whether they're beer, wine, or spirits, they're up big today. Why is that? We're going into the summer season. People buy more alcohol. They're passing on their increases. The other surprise is the fact that a little known fact that most of the major utility companies have to go to utility regulators to, to basically get approval for cost increases. Many of those companies have been effective at doing that. Those stocks were also up big today, not to mention that many of them are sporting dividends that are north of 4.5%. So inflation, unfortunately, is driving the machine. We, I, I happen to agree that we will not see a rate, incre a, a rate cut any time in the foreseeable future. And if the trends continue where we have relatively good employment 
and we have costs continuing to go up, especially with what you talked about with things like food and with oil. Yeah, I mean, you dare say you hate that 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 doesn't happen, but that could be what kills this rally is the Fed unexpectedly raising interest rates. One thing that I heard to mention one of the panels today is that uh, people are are not feeling so great uh, these days, despite uh, the government telling us uh, how wonderful the, the economy is. Uh, because for one thing, people are, are working a lot harder and trying to uh, keep up with inflation nowadays. So uh, working uh, longer hours, and uh, it seems like uh, we're not getting anywhere. Well, that and on top of it, uh, unfortunately, the, the game of passing on these stealthy little taxes on everything imaginable, or, or, or as many governments like to call them, uh, fees, you know, that 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 uh, plays well. I'm, You know, certainly, we, Frank, you and I have covered this many times. I notice it very, very quickly between the two states. When I'm in Nevada, right off the freeway and I pay for gas, it's at least a buck seven to a buck eighty cheaper, and I'm talking about for 91 octane, than when I cross the state line. We all know the game here, and unfortunately, the other trend that probably you, you've probably heard a bit about, I, I mean, just the migration of people. That's going to continue. I don't see any of that stopping whatsoever. And the thing that we have to be looking ahead at, those of us who are money managers, we have clients. If you have a high-tax client who's been buying California municipal bonds because, in theory, they're tax-free, they're moving to Nevada, Florida, or Texas. They no longer need those tax-free bonds, So certainly from California. So that will shift who and what are buying public financings, and that could pinch a lot of the so-called blue states that are desperate for money right now. On the air live with money manager Ken Winans, and uh, you follow crypto uh, now very closely, uh, Ken, and we speak to the biggest fans here as well as the harshest critics. Uh, I see Bitcoin back uh, close to 63000 here at the moment, uh, down about 200 bucks here uh, at the moment. We've seen pretty wild moves uh, with the uh, the crypto um, space uh, back in focus after Bitcoin hit a record high uh, just about a month or so ago, and now back to around uh, 63K and had actually cracked below uh, 60,000 recently. What do you see happening there? You know, the moves in crypto have been crazy. They've been going 3 to 5% a day, so that they, they have been acting like a commodity future from that standpoint. A couple of observations that I've seen, and in and, and us, I'm actually now – a certified cryptocurrency trader, better known as a CCT designation, because I thought it once the Fed, once the SEC gave their blessings on exchange traded funds being available for the common investor, me as a money manager, I need to understand what and how to play these uh, these securities. So here's the thing: uh, a couple of observations. Number one, Ethereum and Bitcoin have been trading differently over the last, I'd say, two weeks, and I think it's because of the having of Bitcoin, which Ethereum is not going to have, at least that I'm not aware of. That's number one. Number two, I think it's just good old-fashioned people taking some profits off the table, redeploying money into different areas. And I've been hearing a lot more where people are doing more with stable coins. They feel more comfortable with it in this very, very volatile environment. So even if they stay within crypto, they're migrating to less volatility. I think you have that. Then, you know, analysis that I recently did, and I'm going to be doing one of my upcoming Forbes articles on it, is the fact that when you look at quarter-to-quarter movements of Bitcoin and Ethereum, they act a lot more with movements to the NASDAQ than they do anything else. So I think that that, you know, and again, that's, that's up for debate on why it's doing that. I just know that they are tracking very closely to movements in the NASDAQ. And with that, I think that the, that trend will probably continue for a while. But, Frank, of the volatilities here, and then let's also not just bring up very quickly, we are going into that month of May. And the old saying in the investment world is sell in May and go away. I've been having a lot of investors ask me about this because they have made so much money in the first part of the year. They want to book some of it now. I think there is going to be a bit of a cash buildup as we go through the summer, especially with the election cycle kicking into gear. Both sides of the spectrum politically are feeling the same way. It's maybe not a bad idea to park some of the money in that cash, get a nice high interest rate on that money now, and wait and see how things play out. On the air live with money manager Ken Winans. Uh, What about good old gold here, Ken, which uh, we've also been following since it hit a record high recently. uh, Back, uh, let's see, $2,324 and change here at the moment. What about uh, gold here now? 
You know, it's gold and silver, and I'm also going to throw copper in, even though, you know, two of those are industrial metals, one of those precious. But it, there, it's, it is a supply and demand-driven thing. In fact, it's interesting, many people don't know, the state of Nevada is the fourth largest gold producer in the world. Uh, it, and so you hear a lot about it right now in Nevada, about what's going on with metal prices and the effect it's having on that economy. But, Frank, I think, again, it goes back to the same thing, that this inflation situation – that people are going back to the old reliable plays of inflation during these times. That happens to be... Afford Anything talks about how to avoid common pitfalls, how to refine your mental models, and how to think about how to think. Paula, while certainly you can mess up on a million dollars a year, it is far less likely than it is on $30,000 a year. Right. I would meet wonderful people that were struggling with a budget that was super tight. It was 100%. You need to make more money. Make smarter choices and build a better life. Afford Anything, wherever you listen. Gold and silver. I have a lot more people talking about it within their portfolios. Than, and these are not people that I would call gold bugs. These are not people who buy gold coins, but they're asking more questions about how can they get involved. What I would caution people on about gold, you know, as somebody, I'm a, I mean, I've been a commodity trader for quite a while, and I worked on the floor, and I see the action in the old exchanges. Be very careful about these knee-jerk things about rushing out and buying a gold coin that you see advertised on television. The markup on gold products can be very, very high. So before you do it, educate yourself on it before you do that impulsive purchase. Very interesting about uh, Nevada and gold. You mentioned isn't Nevada the silver state? Uh, isn't that the, uh, the the state slogan? <laughs> the silver state and yeah, it, and they it have is, all that gold well, too. It's got silver. Yeah, and and now it's got uh, you know it has some of the precious earth metals that we are looking at too. So you know, and, and, and where they, you used to hear the phrase "drill, baby, drill," well, in Nevada they say "dig, baby, dig." So. They're, they're, they're fine with open pit mines and pull those metals out. But, no, it, it, we're going to find that, that, you know, we're trying to find more domestic sources for metals, and it's very loud and clear that, that the basin states are going to play very strong into that as we look out the next decade. But, Frankie, you know, we talked about it real quick. I want to go back to oil real quick. You know, a lot of people are very concerned about the price movement, and, yes, it is geopolitical to a degree, but it's also very seasonal. And I, I know for, I mean, the airlines are saying this, uh, you know, people doing road trips and travels and cruises. The one thing is that the summertime is coming up for a lot of Americans. They're planning those vacations. And it is very typical to see oil move up during the season. So be careful to think it's all geopolitical. It's not. It's also very seasonal. And it, it is par for that course. All right, we see silver, by the way, having a pretty good year, up about, uh, what, 14%. Gold is up about 12% uh, this year. Silver uh, back above $27 an ounce here. Uh, we're keeping an eye on that. And and uh, the earnings parade, uh, Ken, continues. Disney in focus. And uh, I was talking to Charlie Gasparino from uh, Fox Business about uh, the uh, takeover talks um, and a lot of a lot of that swirling around uh, what's going on at Paramount Global at the moment. So uh, Hollywood's still in focus here today. Uh, what about the the, uh, the media names that have been under pressure since that uh, big uh, pair of strikes last year and, and still uh, recovering from all that? Well, and, and the key word there is still recovering from it, Frank. That's the problem when you have wage push inflationary pressures. It brings on strikes, which is, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that went into the employment or the, the wage issues last year, especially around AI. But a lot of it's still coming down to just good old-fashioned uh, cost. And whether you're a highly compensated person or someone on the lower rungs, you all feel the pinch of cost. But with that, there is a typical, a typical scenario of restructuring. Now, in my case, in the case of Paramount Global, I did mention at that time there was a preferred stock that is a high dividend paying security that Paramount Global had issued. And during the strike, it was very cheap and I bought a lot of it. Um, you know, so clearly there will be winners in these consolidations. And I think that, you know, I, I keep hearing a lot about how the industry has shifted a great deal, especially with what's coming on with AI. And quite frankly, I'm hearing more and more about where there is need for studios. Uh, the, the Vegas Chamber of Commerce, I was at a, a conference not long ago, they were talking about that they expect that some of those studios are gonna leave California and possibly migrate their way to Las Vegas or certainly Nevada. So I think that there's gonna be a general shift in things that will continue. But I would say this, 
when you talk about the situation with Disney, when you talk about the situation with Paramount Global, or any, you know, certainly any of the other studios or entertainment companies, just be careful to not place a too big of a bet, hoping that a merger or a consolidation is going to happen, because half the time they don't work out as planned. So in the case of Disney, it's big enough. It's, I mean, obviously, it's a massive, massive company. It can position itself and redo things. But again, just be cautious about trying to game this and gamble on who's going to be taken out and who's not. Uh, but Frank, what I would say, going back to earnings, uh, there were several big players today. One of the ones that I monitor very closely, it was a recommendation I had on your show a while ago, Sterling Construction, S-T-R-L, good example. Uh, it's a construction company. They do both public and private works. No questions asked. Company with a demand for its, certainly in the transportation side of rebuilding roads. Stocks up 16% today. No questions asked. Another company in that kind of area, Fabernet, symbol FN, also up big, 11, 11%. But again, I think that, again, the the earnings plays, you, just because you have earnings, you got to read what's going on there. And if there's consolidation in the bottom line earnings, growth you might although the earnings might be okay you'll see the stock go down because the company is not able to maintain its margins and when companies have missed the number one reason you're hearing about is increased labor costs so again that's going to be a theme we're going to see for the remainder of the year all right let's talk about uh, nvidia back above 900 dollars uh, by the way uh, even though uh, yeah it pulled back actually 15 today to 905 and change and mm -hmm. um and we've been talking about the uh, the Mag Seven down to the uh, to the Fab Four and the Magnificent One uh, Nvidia. What are your thoughts about those names, which of course uh, led the rally uh, last year? Well, you know, it, it, I mentioned earlier that I'm seeing a broadening in this market. You know, every the market when we look at the S and P 500, we have to remember that it is a market cap weighted index. It, it's not it's not evenly weighted, so it's more like an egg where it's elliptical and not an, a, a complete circle. So the leadership can shift and change. For a long time, Apple dominated that index. As you mentioned, NVIDIA and some of the other AI-type companies and cloud-based companies have been driving that machine so far this year. I think the leadership's even going to shift more. I think there's going to be a broadening out. And like I said earlier today, you know, or in this interview, you know, you're seeing utility stocks move. You're seeing consumer staple stocks move. This is healthy. You want to see a rally broaden out if it has any sustainable issues going forward. You don't want to see, uh, you know, like you said, the Magnificent Seven, or they did back in the 70s, they called it the Nifty 50. That's not healthy. So I think now that Nvidia is off its high, for people who want to put those kind of stocks in their portfolio, certainly it's not a bad time to look at doing it. However, remember, it's very volatile. And for a lot of investors who can't stomach volatility, it's not for you. But certainly, it's, it, it, though, I mean, NVIDIA's path is very well chosen. The concerns on valuation, now that it's backed off, there, there's more analysts coming to the table saying it, it's not a bad place to look at buying some of it right now. All right. Before I let you off the hook here, uh, Ken Winans, any specific places where you are putting money now and or taking it off the table? Well, you know, I do like some of these less lesser known names that people just don't really pay attention to. So I'm going to be a little different here, Frank. I'm going to throw a couple of these, uh, especially the alcohol companies. We have so, we have a lot of things to celebrate, including the market going up very strongly this year. So you know, some of these beaten up consumer staple names, I think they still have room to go. Take a look at them. Certainly, with after uh, you know. Uh, uh, some of the controversies around Anheuser-Busch, I would take a look at BUD, uh, symbol B-O-D. Take a look at Brown Foreman, symbol B-F dot B, certainly Molson, T-A-P. And, you know, go back to even some of the non-alcoholic beverages like Coca-Cola. Again, we're going into summertime. People are looking. They're doing more out outdoor activities. They buy these kind of things. I mean, I recently was there somewhere. I haven't drank a Coca-Cola in a long time, and I said, oh, what the heck. So, again, Broaden out your portfolio. Look for those names that typically do well during this time. I would look for things like that. All right. I'm getting thirsty, too, now on some of those things you mentioned here. So, Ken, thank you very much uh, for that comprehensive update, as always. And uh, your analysis here is greatly appreciated. That is Money Manager Ken Winans, Money Manager President of Winans Investments, author of Investment Atlas 1 and 2, also Forbes Magazine contributor, live with us here. Ken, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again uh, for coming to the line. Thank you, Frank. Take care.
Folks, people like you and me have our ear to the ground in all things business. We like to be informed and indeed well prepared. As important as finance is, I want you to have a plan in case you're hit by someone not paying attention to the road. Thinking ahead serves us well. That even still, we can get caught off guard as people are so focused on their destinations that they might not have a plan in case they're in an accident that's not their fault. That's why I encourage you to put my friend, attorney Clark Fielding's number, in your phone. That number is 833-88-SHARK. So if you're in an accident, you'll be ready with your strategy to make Clark Fielding your very first call. Fielding Law aims for the highest possible settlement, considering you might need long-term care, rehab, compensation for lost wages, and any ongoing physical or emotional pain. So if you're hurt in any kind of accident, call for a free consultation with Fielding Law. You can trust them. They're honest, respected, and your strategy in case you get into that unexpected accident. Motorcycle, truck, pedestrian, scooter, hit-and-run boating or bike accidents, you name it, the number to call 833-88-SHARK. That's 833-88-SHARK. Or go to ClarkTheSharkLaw.com. So I'm Mikey KBC welcomes Howard Jones and ABC with Haircut 100 to the YouTube Theater coming up on August 20th. Live Nation's Concert Week is here with $25 tickets to more than 5,000 shows. Tickets are on sale now through May 14th at Ticketmaster.com. Right now, Caller 9 wins at 1-888-795-222. You can get a pair of tickets to the show if you are Caller 9. Call right now, 1-888-795-222. Motaco Money continues here, 790 KBC. The Dow coming in for a closing gain of 32 points at 38,884. The S&P 500 of 7 at 5,188. And the NASDAQ down 17 at 16,000. 332. The yield in the 10 year note now back down to 4.46%. Bitcoin down about 200 now at 62,855. Ethereum down 11 at 3,036. Doge at the moment at 15 cents. Gold up 10 cents to $2,324.30 an ounce. Crude oil down 1 cent at 78.37 a barrel. Nvidia shares tumbling nearly $16 today at 9.05 and change. Apple moving slightly higher up 69 cents at 182.40. The price of gold at uh, 2400 uh, make that $2,324.30 an ounce. Silver right now at $27.48 an ounce. Motec on Money continues here on 790 KBC, coming to you from the Milken Institute Global Conference. And, of course, it's a mega event. We're bringing together the movers and shakers from around the world. Joining us now, economist Kevin Cloudon, a familiar voice on this program, executive director of Milken Institute Finance. Kevin Cloudon, wonderful to see you here. Thank you very much for taking a moment to step aside from this uh, mega event and give us your impressions of the conference this year. Well, I think that the conference is, is always incredibly well positioned in terms of the time, in terms of the number of the issues. Right now, even as we speak, we have a significant panel talking about Ukraine and the future. We've had sessions, uh, there's a session going on in regards to gun violence and how to combat that. We've had sessions talking uh, about the future of the world's financial system and economy. We've had discussions about climate resiliency, we had economic opportunity, science and key issues that have permeated throughout this uh, conference. And we had uh, President Malay of Argentina who spoke yesterday and whether you agree with him or not, he is still a very dynamic personality who is trying to tackle a fundamental issue of hyperinflation that here in the U.S. we can't even imagine. We can't even come to grips with the idea of just chronic inflation in a country that runs in the couple hundred percent, sometimes soaring way past that, and financial problems and fiscal problems that have gone back cyclically for decades. Very exciting and a broad political spectrum uh, indeed around the world. Uh, and Elon Musk, uh, a big highlight here. Uh. Named one of the best personal finance podcasts, The Stacking Benjamin Show with Joe and his friends makes financial literacy fun. Let's hear another success story. This one comes to us from Stacker Derek. You guys are the best and it's because of you I now understand retirement accounts, money in general, and how poorly the guests are treated when they show up. I really don't <laughs> know where I would be without you. Thank you for 1500 And here's to another 1500 if Doug can survive that long without pay. Find out more by searching the Stacking Benjamins podcast wherever you listen. At the conference. 
Yeah, so Elon Musk, we, we, great to have him back. It's been a number of years since the last time he was here. The last time he was here, Tesla was on the way up. SpaceX, SpaceX was becoming the big news. Now SpaceX is the force. You can't even imagine space travel, space programs, space anything without them. Even with other competitors, they are the giant uh, gorilla of, of the space market. And... Tesla, of course, remains incredibly relevant. And, of course, he you know, bought Twitter and transformed it into X. So he remains incredibly topical. Regardless of what you may feel about his moves, they impact everybody. And over the two and a half plus uh, decades now that you've had the conference, we've seen a lot of ups and downs in the economy, including the, the Great Recession, the, the pandemic. Uh, and fast forward to where we are right now. Uh, we're in the middle of whatever it is we're in the middle of, I guess. Right. So give us your impression of uh, the economy here at the moment. Well, we have an economy that uh, one of the ironies is that the U.S. economy is right now holding up the rest of the world. We kept on talking about China as the great economic engine. And even though China has reported generally good GDP numbers, there's this waking up and this recognition that suddenly what is going on in China isn't necessarily benefiting uh, or pulling along the rest of the world. Uh, China has been keeping up its manufacturing, often by cutting prices below market, which is something that they haven't had to resort to for a very long time. Uh, you've, you're seeing issues that are going on with a shift to India. Uh, you're seeing Europe essentially in a malaise, in part because of the fact that the Ukraine conflict has continued to be an issue. It has affected European energy markets, has affected uh, overall European labor markets, has affected a great deal of things. And meanwhile, the U.S. is growing and is has gained productivity in a way that nobody else has. But American workers aren't feeling it and don't feel like they're benefiting. They've seen food prices, rental prices, uh, home purchase prices, car prices, everything has skyrocketed way faster than wages. And so a lot of Americans, even though they're in what should be the most dynamic uh, and strongest economy in the world, they don't feel like they're benefiting. And of course, geopolitics, a big subject here, including what's going on with Israel and Hamas, so the war that started on October 7th after Israel was attacked by Hamas terrorists. And obviously a lot of concerns about that. Uh, impacting not only the oil uh, part of the economy, but also a uh, uh, broad range of uh, economic issues here, uh, as well as social issues. And what are your uh, impressions about the uh, discussion on that? Well, it's, it's an incredibly divisive topic, largely because of the fact that Gaza has been a neglected, unresolved subject for 20 years. Uh, they, if you go back, that essentially it's been sitting there, especially once Hamas took over, it became essentially a pariah section where nobody really invested, nobody really did anything, and Hamas is, is desperate for attention, whether or not you argue that the Iranians have played a role in that and various other allies and supporters. It's a big deal, and... The fact is that you see campus protests all over the United States. Those are making the news all the time. We, you know, we saw um, the police move in, uh, obviously, at UCLA. We've seen them in Columbia. In fact, early this morning, uh, they cleared out, uh, without arrest, but they still cleared out the campus protesters at the University of Chicago, who had, who had maintained uh, a lot more quiet and decorum up to this point. So it, and it really is all over the place. This issue doesn't go away, and it's going to actually have impacts on politics. It's having impacts on our our debate. But at the same time, you know, we see the news talking about the hostage negotiations. We see the news about uh, it, how it affects it. And for uh, even for uh, not only for us in terms of obviously our chairman is, has very long ties with Israel, but also he has very long ties with the rest of the Middle East. You know, we have a very large Saudi presence here, a large presence from the UAE, from Qatar, who are all here at the conference. And the the Hamas attack, it's worth remembering, disrupted what were negotiations between Israel and Saudi Arabia that were believed to be creating some sense of st further stability and closure, and it set a lot of that back. On the air with economist Kevin Cloudon at the Milken Institute, and of course you've been moderating many of these uh, panel uh, discussions, and including those focused on what's happening right here uh, at home uh, with uh, the homeless issue, uh, certainly a big one, and and uh, what's happening with crime and the overall economy here. Uh, give us your impressions of what's happening uh, here on Main Street. 
Well, what's happening right now, and this is something that uh, a number of the discussions behind the scenes still go on, and obviously we have this discussion throughout uh, Southern California in particular, it's a problem, unfortunately, that's not just a Southern California problem anymore. It's all over the place. And that is, we don't have enough housing. Our ho- it costs too much even to build shelters for the homeless, which just is crazy. Uh, we have a number of regulations that make things very difficult. A lot of people who are NIMBYs, they don't, they want it in their back, they don't want shelters in their backyard. And yet, if they don't build the shelters, they have the homeless on the streets. And it's the statistics show that if you know homeless have access to just enough resources, they want to get off the street. The vast majority of them, and th- this is a fundamental issue that's been building, since starting going back to the financial crisis in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and really exacerbated by the pandemic. And we're feeling and seeing this, and it reflects the fact that there is this this split right now between who's benefiting from the great American economy and all those people who are being left behind, and we see it everywhere. And it's become a dominant issue, not just in California. We're seeing pushes against homeless encampments in other parts of the country who've never even had to deal with homeless before. This is a dominant, strong issue. And it is something that is incredibly important for us. Driving around, we see those uh, driverless taxis now. We see those uh, couriers, those uh, robotic couriers. And even here, there's a robot making coffee. AI, a big subject. Robots, a big subject. Anything that that strikes you uh, on that front? Well, the big concern with AI and the big thing uh, that we're seeing here is, you know, what's the economic future? You know, who gets displaced by AI? You know, does AI work to actually improve productivity to benefit and aid workers? And there are a lot of ways it can. And there are a lot of ways. It, uh, but it also what AI does is it, it moves the threat of automation to white collar workers in a way that you haven't seen up to this point. Up to this point, it's really been automation for blue collar workers. We have a lot of discussions about you know, restaurants, we hear stories about the robots and the Amazon factories, things like that. But when you suddenly start seeing, whether it's stock analysts, whether you see, um, you know, in the insurance industry, you see it in the back offices for clerical work, you see it, especially in Hollywood, where people are raising that threat. It, it's all over the place. And we have a number of discussions uh, talking about AI here and including the uh, issue of AI and how it ties into cybersecurity. And cybersecurity is a major, major topic for us because we're realizing that as we've automated and put computers into all parts of our infrastructure, we've created incredible vulnerabilities and there is clear evidence that foreign actors have been testing our cybersecurity in ways that the average American does not think about. So many interesting subjects, so many interesting insights and discussions here. As always, wish we had more time. Economist Kevin Cloud, the executive director of Milken Institute Finance here, coming to us from the Milken Institute Global Conference in Beverly Hills. Kevin Cloud, great to see you here. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here today on Motac on Money on 790 KBC. My pleasure. And uh, thanks to all of you. And uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Motec on Money continues here in 790 KBC, coming to you from the Milken Institute Global Conference. AI, a big topic of conversation and how it impacts the markets. And with me now is Greg Emerson, Global Head of Tech Capital from Boston Consultancy Group, BCG. Greg, great to connect with you here. Tell us about what you told this group here. So we talked a lot yesterday about two topics. First is just how massive the overall investment opportunity is going to be in AI over the next five years. We expect to see about a trillion dollars, that's a trillion with a T, in spend on AI applications. Those are uh, tools that are used by businesses and consumers that are built on top of the big uh, large language models like OpenAI. So we think it's going to be a big market over the next five years. And we think it has lots of implications from everything down from the software companies that are going to be building those applications all the way down to data centers and power companies that are going to be uh, powering everything. Things evolving very, very quickly, and you're based right there in Silicon Valley. Uh, what's, uh, what's the hottest thing you're seeing there at the moment? You know, I think a lot of people in Silicon Valley like to talk about the startup world, but what I'm most excited about here is how a lot of the existing software companies, I think, are going to be pretty big winners here. I think a lot of the AI applications that are built are going to be built by the existing software companies that you all know today. Um, I mean, many of them publicly traded, many of them also kind of privately owned by, by PE funds. But I think they're going to be the ones doing a lot of the innovation on top of these big LLMs and the main ones who are going to be delivering tools to, uh, to customers and to businesses in the future. 
course, uh, NVIDIA and the Magnificent Seven led that market rally last year. Um, where are uh, where are you putting money now and or taking it off the table uh, among the Magnificent Seven and, and among the uh, the AI players nowadays? So, I'm a, I, look, I'm a big believer in all the different software companies that are big in the market now and what their future is going to be. And the reality is there's just going to be a massive demand around uh, from cloud services, uh, from from chips, from everything that, could, that that powers all of this. And so it's hard to pick an individual winner, but I think all those players in the sector have lots of tailwinds and that the, we're just in the early innings of how much spend is going to be associated with this category. Where are you seeing the most interest uh, at the moment uh, where uh, AI, uh, perhaps, of course, every company is a tech company nowadays, but um, are you seeing creative uh, use of of AI already in areas that uh, you may not have even thought of? Well, I'd say, first of all, I think we really haven't seen anything in terms of the creative use of AIs. We're in the very early days. Uh, people don't fully realize that the uh, the foundational models, the LLMs, things like OpenAI, have just been built out. Um, what's really exciting is the applications that are going to be built on top of that. ChatGPT is the application you and I know both, but that's just an application. And many other different use cases and applications can be built on top of these, which is what makes it most powerful. In terms of what I'm personally most excited about, I'm personally most excited about to see the sort of development, we're actually going to see in software development itself, tools that allow uh, uh, more junior software developers to become more efficient. Things will literally write code for you and actually allow even just a further acceleration of, of the software category overall. How is this going to impact labor? A lot of discussion about how many jobs will be lost in all of this. Um, what are your thoughts on that one? I think it's a really important topic. I think that there's going to be uh, certain categories of the economy, particularly things around uh, uh, contact center, phone customer service, where, look, the reality is these AI tools can readily take 20, 30, 40 percent out of those sales forces. Not as many of those people are based in the U.S. today. It's a lot of offshore, but has real implications for certain foreign governments where uh, that's a major part of the uh, the economy. But I think you're going to see this span beyond uh, beyond just customer service. It's going to in- impact knowledge workers. It's going to back workers within the finance function, um, lots of folks who are doing work around research, synthesis, etc. This is a tool that's going to not replace them, certainly augment their skills and certainly mean that there's not, not a need for as many of them. And so one thing I've been hearing a lot about here at Milken is just concerns from government regulators in terms of how we think about that dislocation and that reskilling that's going to need to happen over the next few years. You're probably used to seeing this already in the Bay Area, but we're seeing these driverless uh, taxis here already. Uh, I guess they're still being uh, tested here, but uh, driverless cars and and zooming out to the bigger uh, tech picture. uh, What else uh, are you excited about uh, this year? Well, I think we're still a few years away from driverless cars, <laughs> at least driverless cars that uh, that 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 I, I'd be comfortable, you know, put it, putting my putting my kids in. But the the technology is advancing um, really quickly. I, I think I what I'm personally actually most excited as someone who has a couple of kids is a lot of the study tools that I think are going to emerge. And people are very focused on oh, you're going to use ChatGPT to write your essay or to do your homework. Uh, for me, I'm actually really excited that my my kids can use it as a way to learn. It's it's an incredibly valuable tool for just researching and learning and educating yourself about various topics. It can simplify things. It can make them more complex. And so I'm really excited to see my kids learn how to use this in the school, in the classroom, in a functional, effective way, rather than in a dishonest way. Greg Emerson, Global Head of Tech Capital at BCG, coming to us all the way from the Bay Area here at the Milken Institute Global Conference in Beverly Hills. Great to connect with you here, Greg. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us on all things tech and AI. We will do more at 4 tomorrow afternoon, live from the conference again, where the world has doing a lot of moving and shaking here. About 4,000 movers and shakers have gathered here in Beverly Hills for the Milken Institute Global Conference, and we're up for another day uh, tomorrow. Stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Randy Wang, and I'll be back tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock with Motec on Money right here on 790 KBC. Welcome to Talkville, the ultimate Smallville rewatch podcast. Guest star Sarah Carter as Alicia Baker. Although I didn't really work with her a lot. But Tom did, and they had some real big smoochy scenes. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Could there be any more sex? What was a three-page makeout scene that just kept going? Good Lord. We get it. They have chemistry. Jump in now or catch up on any of the past seasons of Talkville on YouTube or wherever you listen.